good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Miller, and I have a confession to make. I, I am a historian. And I want to thank Ari for making this nice distinction at the end of the last panel between collecting and representing. Because uh, I think it's actually a nice way to, it's a nice segue to this next panel. That's probably actually um, a tension that we're going to be grappling with in most of these papers throughout the next day and a half. Um, this is a panel which is called The Politics and Aesthetics of Memory. So it is also dealing, of course, with some forms of um, representing and interpreting uh, various kinds of documented memory, and maybe also undocumented memory. Uh, we have uh, three speakers today, and I will follow Angela's lead and give brief introductions and note that there are more extensive introductions in the uh, in the conference booklet. Uh, so our first speaker today is going to be Miguel Angel Vargas Rubio, who is at the Progr Programa de Doctoro en Historia y Estudios Semánicos at the University in Seville. Um, our second speaker will be Alexandra Chefan, um, who is the Fortunoff Fellow at the Wiesenthal Institute here in Vienna. Uh, and the third speaker is Ana Belen Martin Siviliano, uh, who's at the Department of World Literature and Languages at the University of Montreal. And when we put together the schedule, we actually made a very, very conscious effort not to have geographic uh, but rather topical panels. So this is just a mere coincidence that we have two um, speakers originally from Spain. Um, we actually made a, a clear effort to to avoid um, having real topical or geographic focus and to really think about the, the themes uh, that bring together a lot of the different papers. Um, just in time for uh, for YouTube. Okay, so we have this paper is called Between Horrible Strangeness and Sad Joy for the Spanish Roma reading of the Poeta. Okay. Yeah. okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Maria, Angela, and all the friends and the people who make possible this kind of um, meetings. It's, 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 it's very important, as Angela said, that, uh, that this is a workshop, so we are kind of less um, we feel like less pressure no so, um, then secondly um sometimes I think I, I'm more a, a storyteller than an art historian <laughs> and and I always re um, I remember my my two grandparents um from my dad's side and um, my grandfather Juan um, he knew how to read and when when they were uh, working in the countryside in the field and uh, living with other Gitanos, other Roma in these kind of uh, facilities with uh, really bad conditions. So he, in the evenings before going to sleep, he used to read the newspapers and the far west novels. And my grandmother, who didn't know how to read, she was, um, and she used, used to tell her own version of the newspaper news and the far west novel. So I think I'm gonna follow my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm an art historian, theater director, and nowadays also I'm working for a public institution in Sevilla, a, a cultural center called Factoria Cultural, which is located in in what is officially the poorest uh, neighborhood of Spain and uh, with a high statistical Gitano population. Um, and as part of my of my work there, which is somehow promoting critical discourses on, on, on Roman art, I um, I um, I organize or design sorry, I design an exhibition of, of Drawings by Tres which were um, borrowed by Moffat um, Hancock, and that somehow forced me to make the, the interpretation 
Oh, well, I'm, I'm bringing this memory no, uh, of the Holocaust, which is seen through the eyes of Chiasoica, to one of the worst neighborhoods of Spain, in which literally people live ten, at least 10 years less than the average of the population. So during the whole, the, the many visits that we, we have, the, the, the many uh, experiences, I had to tell really terrible stories and we, we, I had to somehow talk about how art can be used as a tool to overcome traumas. No? So, but then at the same time, it forced me to think about, okay, how are we telling the story of the Holocaust, of the Roma, of the experiences of the, of the Holocaust of the Roma from, uh, in Spain? And I, I realized that there is a, uh, there's a, normally there's a translation of documents, papers, congresses, legal documents, and that somehow we have in, adopted as part of our uh, agendas, right? sometimes even like these international political political agendas, in which we, in certain days, we commemorate, like the 26th of January, the, the 2nd of August, and so we, without making the effort of, uh, of, uh, of being aware of our position as a Gitanos of Spain, we are uh, adopting <laughs> this kind of I wouldn't say uh, an external uh, memory, but it, it, there is this kind of somehow this didn't happen to us, this idea. So I decided to face that, to combat that idea. Why? Because um, there is a, a future possibility uh, that can explain why we haven't, we, we haven't been taught, we haven't been explained. Uh, no one explained us the history of the Roman Holocaust during more than 50 years. So it's very important to um, to make the genealogy of how the memory of of the Roman survivors of the Roman Holocaust came into uh, the Spanish context. Obviously, this is a very big uh, um, um, concept and it's very complex. So I decided to to focus just in 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 two aspects. One is, uh, I will use an example of a, a film, a song, and a family uh, story, like a personal family story. And I will try to combine the three to pro problematize this, how this, this memory of the Holocaust was sent out. Okay? So, uh, it's very important to make clear to make clear that that has happened to the storytellers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very important to make clear that, that the connections between the Franco regime and the um, Axis, our Hitler regime, were, um, were established even much before the civil, the, the, the Spanish civil war. Uh, in the 1930s newspapers of Spain, it was very normal to see in the in the second or third pages, articles by Gering, Gennels. So it was, so it's, it's very um, complex to think from our nowadays perspective that it was normal in, in, my, in my city in Sevilla to, to read, to see a reportage of the, of the marches of the Nazis in the Spanish press. So at the time, there was a translation of this ideology. No? And then, um, um, far away of this idea of uh, disconnecting ourselves from the memory of, or from the, um, the history of the Holocaust, my, my idea is that the Spanish state has also responsibility in the murdering of the woman. How? Well, basically, first of all, because of the relationship, of the official relationship, uh, officially until 1942, but we know that uh, under the table, there were many, many, many businesses, dealings, um, but um, most importantly, after the war, Spain became uh, no, no, only as a as a as a stopping place on the way to South America for many Nazi criminals, but as a paradise.
for many of them. Um, because as you know, well, Spain was a dictatorship until 1975. So that gave time to, uh, to change the memory. So, we are in 1951. Spain hasn't been yet accepted in the United Nations. And uh, so they need to, <laughs> the, 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 they need to show a less fascist uh, aesthetic or less fascist uh, image on public. So, and they use cinema for that. And so we are going to see an example of a film, 1951. Okay. Okay, this is called Loga la Picolera. Okay. Uh, it's a 1934 play, the theater play written by Jose Maria Benan, who was like the official fascist poet of the regime. Um, so sometimes I make the joke that the, 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 the 1934 uh, premiere of this play was a, a failure. So, so they had to kill one million people to make them play like this. So, uh, the story is, is, uh, is about the Peninsula War, 19, so it's located in, in terms of time in 1812 and Napoleon War. No? So, there's a French uh, military uh, in love with a, um, a Spanish singer. Yeah. So, they are talking in the middle of the countryside, like where their love can be possible. Yeah. So, they say, our love can be only possible in a world without frontiers <laughs> and, and without flags. So, and then in the middle of the of the countryside, you see this. Uh, okay, this cover. <laughs> or something like, like that, no? Okay, and the song, this song uh, was released later by the singer, uh, Juanita Reina, as a, um, like different from the, okay, different from the, from the film, so it somehow, it was available for, for people. So, and then, in, in 1971, Sorry. So bear in mind, um, 1951 song um, composed by a fascist <coughs> poet, um, talking about Gitanos as uh, like a, the guarantee of a free world uh, in a world without frontiers. So in 1951, Spain without being accepted in the being accepted in the United Nations. And then we have the same song. In 1971 TV program on Flamenco, kind of anthropological <laughs> approach, and they go to the house of the mother of a of a, one of the most known Flamenco dynasties, um, the family of our friend Gonzalo, and they go to the house because they they have this idea of going to see to to record Flamenco. In not in the stages, but in the houses of where the flamenco and the flamenco live. So, and then they, <coughs> they sing this song. <coughs> Well, I 
Controlling the where things can come from. Yeah. So uh, this song uh, became like a kind of anthem for many Gitanos in, in my area, in my hometown. Um, many of the relatives didn't know this story of the how the song was composed by a fascist poet in a time where Spain needed to show a different or less fascist. Um, yeah, static. Okay, so and then the personal story, and I'm gonna tell you these three things just to try to reflect a bit on how complex is, uh, how complex is to tell the, this the, um, traumatic stories. No, so uh, in 2003 I did a solo quiz called uh, Consuelo la Virgen Gitana. In which I was telling the story of uh, an aunt of mine, and a sister of my father, who I didn't know because she died uh, when she was 15, before I was born, in, in the 50s, the beginning of the 50s, in the end of And uh, um, uh, she had like a uh, spina bifida, like double column, yeah? which was something um, <laughs> common in people with really bad. Nutrition. So she died, and the, the only thing I knew of her was a little photo that was at my grandmother's house. Um, and somehow, I, my father never, still today, never had told me uh, her story. So I had to somehow uh, reconstruct her story from sketches from different members of my family and some other Hitanos. So I Instead of doing a show in which I I would I get an actor, I did myself. I performed Consuelo. I I asked my mother her wedding dress, and I make a uh, kind of ritual in which I was telling uh, scenes uh, around uh, five different moments in which a, a Gitano uh, woman uh, would dress in white. Okay. Okay, so I did this show and it was really a great ritual. And then during this, um, a couple of years ago, is when I started to um, reflect on this idea of we need uh, to have a, um, a Hitano reading of the Roma Holocaust. Then during this process of reading and realizing that there is this, this connection, I found uh, this woman and uh, I owned. And she had a really, really bad life. And the last years, she was sent to a, a, a hospital for terminal um, people, no? Like, with no solution. <laughs> um, and then she, um, I was reading about the hospital, and there was a doctor uh, called Luis, Luis Gorrochaga, something like that. Uh, um, a uh, past country uh, name, a really past name, um, and he was there, and he was known as the Doctor Pirata. And um, it was known for this nickname because during the weekends he used to go to Tanger, Morocco, or, or to the Canary Islands to uh, to buy um, um, like stuff and to make illegal illegal businesses, no? 
as a way to um, increase uh, his income no, in the hospital. So, and he was there. But suddenly, in one of, uh, of his trips to, to Tangier, um, he had to escape to Argentina. And then, years later, he came back to Madrid and with a different name. And it turns out that this man was not uh, from Basque country. He was a, a Nazi doctor. He was in Mauthausen and that and the whole. And well, I don't know if he somehow treated my own, but my family didn't know about that. So, to the complexity of dealing, having to talk about the life of my own, my 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 father never never saw this show I was doing. My mother said. Nice, nice show. Never bring it to our hometown. <laughs> uh, so adding to this complexity of uh, facing traumatic experiences in family uh, history. So imagine what do how do we talk? How how can we not talk about the connection between uh, the real situation of the Hidans uh, of Spain and how this experiences of the Holocaust came by with this particular experience, no? And I will leave it here. Okay. Thank you. And our next uh, paper by Alexandra is Romani genocide has taken place on the fringes. Negotiating Memorial Agency <coughs> testimony of <coughs> Um, some short trip towards art, art history. Um, this year, the Biennale de Arte di Venezia, curated by Cecilia Alemani and entitled The Milk of Dreams, after a book of British surrealist Leona Carrington, is dominated by women artists and dedicated to rewriting the history of art in order to open the door to its female counterpart, always present yet overlooked and kept on the sidelines. The National Pavilion of Poland somehow follows this path. It is filled by a 12-part large format tapestry created by Romani visual artist Małgorzata Mirgatas, who in the installation Re-Enchanting the World tells the story of Romani identity, global, local, women's internet. Those images of historical Romani nomadic life are juxtaposed with scenes from the contemporary everyday life of the artist community in Czarnogóra. The middle section of the installation is dedicated to Romani her story and portrays Roma women, both from Mirgata's private circle and public figures, who in the last decades changed Romani lives and the ways in which they are perceived by the majority culture. <coughs> One of the heroines is Christina Gill, Romani Holocaust survivor depicted in the corner of the pavilion. She died one year before the opening of the Biennale in spring 2021 at the age of 83. Gil is portrayed in a, as a middle-aged woman sitting in an armchair in a relaxed position wearing a red blouse. The confident posture is un unmistakable to anyone who has watched a recording of her speaking. Uh, in her Biennale appearance, Christina Gil is clearly giving a testimony. As the artist Mabujata Mikata's conference, her portrait was based on a still from a video interview from the 1990s. Namely, the interview Christina Gill recorded for the Fortuna Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies on May 13, 1995. This testimony is the first account of many that Gill would, would go on to give to various institutions and at various occasions in the following years, when she became one of the most prominent witnesses of Romani genocide in Poland. In this presentation, I would like to offer a close reading of the situation that Mirgatas captured in her work. Namely, Christina Gill's first appearance in a testimonial setting. I will interpret her Fortuna interview as a complex and dynamic performance in which, through manifold negotiations, Gill becomes a witness of the Romani Holocaust and an active agent of Romani history memory. As I will show, 
These negotiations happen within a specific institutional context and at the, and at the intersection of class, gender, and ethnicity that distinguish the witness from her interviewer and decide about her status. So Gil's account is the only Romani testimony among 32 interviews recorded in Polish and on site that are part of the Fortuna collection. Moreover, similarly to other testimonies recorded in Krakow, all of them uh, of Jewish survivors, her testimony is filmed in a room at the headquarters of the Krakow Jewish religious community. Her interviewer is Michał Sobelman, a second generation Polish Jew, a 1968 emigrant to Israel, historian and diplomat. As it soon turns out, the interviewer's conceptual framework, namely embedment in Jewish history and collective memory, and lack of tools to explore Gil's history in a profound way, make him uh, flounder in his own preconceptions and stereotypes. Their conversation will become an arena of misunderstandings, clashes of expectations, but also of short, short circuits of sudden understanding and solidarity. Yet I would argue these discrepancies do not need necessarily to be treated as at a disadvantage. For as Marshenker wrote, those messier more and more unplanned moments that emerge throughout the testimony <coughs> process represent unexpected and essential traces of meaning, end of quote. And it is exactly a quote, the very untidiness of the testimony, as in Hannah Pauline Gallery words, that can produce insight. End quote. In the case of Christian Ideas <coughs> interview, Tension between us opens the testimony to unexpected possibilities and allow other tangential narratives to transpire. I will show three such side stories. Firstly, history of rural peripheral Romani Holocaust outside the house. Secondly, the account on political and economical uh, ramifications of struggle to secure official remembrance of Romani genocide. Thirdly, narrative of Romania, social mobility and emancipation in socialist Poland. At the center of Gil's account stands her survival. In July 1943, as a five years old girl, Christina Gil, at the time children, escaped the massacre of 93 Roma in Polish village of Szturowa near Kraków. At 3 a.m., the Romani settlement in the village was surrounded by the Polish Blue Police and German Gendarmerie, and the first transport of Roma were forced on carts uh, that took them to the local cemetery where they were shot and thrown into a mass grave. Then the cards came back for the remaining women and children, including Christina's grandmother and herself. On their way to the cemetery, the convoy stopped and the gendarmes visited a local inn. A Polish blue policeman told Romani women that they should try to run away, and Christina, with her grandmother, managed to escape. They spent the rest of the war in the Kieleski region, hiding in several villages. A couple of years after the liberation, they came back into Shurova, where Christina finished primary school and started vocational school. The execution is Gil's first memory, a foundation of her whole experience. Yet her interviewer's epistemological framework and social status of Warsaw-based intellectual does not allow him to fully engage with her story. Sobelman speaks from a central position, frequently misspells the name of the village, it seems to be unfamiliar with the peripheral rural char character of the massacre. In the lack of common grounds, he refers to his symbolic capital. He mentions the film and the violin stopped playing as a point of reference, which narrates the entangled fates of Jews and Roma during the Holocaust between Warsaw and Auschwitz, to rather different than these experiences. Yet, Shurova is on the outskirts of these well-known stories. But it is not only rural character of genocide that Gil survived, uh, which Sobelman seems to be unfamiliar to. Also, specificity of Romani Holocaust slips his attention. Among 13 interviews he recorded for the Fortuna Archive, Christina Gil is his only Romani interlocutor. He himself is a descendant of Jewish survivors, and perhaps these two factors decide about the fact that he is the typical, especially for the Fortuna Archive interviews, position of interviewer as a careful listener and uses their conversation as an opportunity to inquire the witness about historical matters. This peculiar epistemological stand has surprisingly interesting effects. Thus, at some point, Sobelman asks Gil, do you know roughly how many Roma people, how many gypsies died during the Second World War here in Poland? Has any uh, research have been done? His unapologetic ignorance provokes a detailed answer from the witness, who explains for only the uniqueness of Romani Holocaust and the reasons 
for its underexplored status, she says. A large number of people were buried at <coughs> unknown sites. The only thing we know about uh, our family's grave is the location because the grave is here, is there. But many people were buried and there are no graves. So in the forest, you kind of get the feeling that they are somewhere, but there is no sign that Roma people are there. I don't know if the exact number has been established by anyone. I doubt it. Because gypsies did not register their fixed addresses. They just stayed at a given place. They were uh, there, but it's not known how many there were and how many died. The specific tension between interviewer and interviewee brings their four results. Supplements, deafness, prompts deal to give comprehensive yet effectively invested characterization of Romani Holocaust outside the camp. As Gil testimony clearly shows, in the countryside, Romani genocide had a rather blurred and intimate character and was a matter of communal effort. It engaged the whole village in discrete acts of killing, giving cards, digging graves, looting the ab abundant property. Another characteristic of the rural Romani Holocaust, as well, so well diagnosed by Gil, was its dispersed and ubiquitous character. Jerzy Kitowski, Polish ethnographer and specialist in Roman history, summarized it in a following manner. In all regions of the occupied country, the situation was the same. It happened everywhere, singular families, singular people who managed to escape transports of execution were hunted and killed. To give a telling example, in a range of 20 kilometers from Szturowa, three other villages witnessed, um, witnessed massacres of Roma in the very same period. In 1942, there were big executions in, in Wojentin and Bielcza. In 1943, in Żabno, more than 40 Roma were shot. This was the prevailing character of Romani genocide in Eastern Europe. It was carried out mostly outside the extermination camps in a plethora of individual locations, often in the peripheries of human settlements, on the fields, and in the forests where the Roma were pursued and murdered, often with the uh, help of non-Roma neighbors. Their graves are, until today, often uncommemorated. But Solomon lacks also more general knowledge that would enable him to make uh, more of a conversation with Gil. He does not distinguish between Romani subgroups and he never asks the witness from which group she comes from, nor whether she speaks Romani. He does not know about Romani traditions and customs. Even though Gil comes from a non-nomadic Romani settlement that had lived with Polish and Jewish neighbors for decades, the interviewer inquires whether she misses their gypsy caravan life uh, or asks about her views on the palaces of rich Polish Roma in Zgierz, Gierwódź. Those questions are based on perceived difference and projected othering. More often, however, there are moments of interaction between him and the witness uh, when the interviewer uses uh, in his questions, a more familiar template, namely a comparison with the Jewish experience. As Ali Roskovich uh, aptly showed, the memory of the Romani Holocaust exists in a strong yet profoundly asymmetrical relationship with the Shoah, and I quote, every, every, even today, Romani history cannot be written without taking account of Jewish archival and memory politics, end of quote. The institutional setting of Gil's testimony, the place of the interview, its mere singularity, the persona of the interviewer, are obvious instances of this situation. Yet, it also demonstrates that the Shoah history and remembrance create the basic templates through which the Romani genocide is interpreted and commemorated. This frame is visible from the very beginning of the interview when Soberman asks Gil if he should call her Gypsy or Roma. When she gives him hesitant answer that maybe Roma somehow sounds gentler, and she would not take offense if somebody called her gypsy, he misinterprets it in analogous to the ne negative anti-Semitic connotations of the use of the word true in Polish and proceeds to call her gypsy through the whole interview. The Shah is a constant frame of reference also for the interviewee. Gil emphasizes that both Jews and gypsies lived through almost the same ordeal during the war. And at some point, Sobelman asks his interlocutor directly, are you interested in Jewish martyrdom during the Second World War? The similarity of experience of Roma and Jews prompts uh, also the discussion about the experience of hiding and passing as Poles or whites in the term during the occupation. The witness describes how she um, didn't have the look, and the interviewer ponders whether she could have been mistaken for a Jew. Yet, the seemingly analogous position of Roma and Jews may be also a source of differentiation. When the witness talks about her need to be close to the murdered and their coming back to Shirova after the war, the interviewer uh, uh, comments, it was like a magnet that attracted people. The interviewer rebuts, 
why people uh, start to run away, just for instance, were leaving Poland to stay away from the country where their families had been killed. It is not only the similarity of the war experiences of Jews and Roma that is constantly evoked, but also the question of the collective memory about both genocides after the war. As Joskovic emphasizes, understanding the relation between Roma and Jews in the aftermath of genocide and finding the reasons for institutional and dispersive exclusion of the former group must be based on analysis of the economy of knowledge production. Memory and memorializing are also expression of power, Gabriel Ternauer rightly observed. Gil's testimony offers a point of discussion on that matter. At the end of the recording, Soberman inquires. You know that Jews uh, were uh, the primary victim of Hitler's bestiality. Jews honor the memory of all murdered Jews, and there are museums, research in, is being conducted, and there are institutions tasked with doing that. In that context, don't gypsies who were also victims, even uh, though few people are aware of it, along with Jews, feel upset? Don't you personally feel upset that the fate of gypsies has been forgotten both by history and by people? Gil responds with a poetic phrase, Romani genocide has taken place on the fringes. In this short statement, the witness summarizes the dynamics of power relations in the remembrance of Romani genocide. She recalls her planned trip to Washington, since she was to be a part of Romani delegation, together with Roman Kretkowski and Andrzej Girga, to the talks about ways of including Romani Holocaust in the USHMN main exhibition. Yet she cancelled her visit due to the financial reasons. Money in relation to remembrance and restitution is a recurrent topic. The witness complains that she cannot get her family land in Shurova back, mentions problems with getting compensation among the Roma. She comments, this is very unfair because, for instance, compensation is offered to the person who were in camps. Those in camps died, but there are those uh, who are alive and continue to live with their memory with all that. Let's take the orphans. What have they experienced in their lives? Poverty and squalor. They shall certainly not live long enough to obtain compensation because there are simply no persons among us who would promote the, the, the interest of those gypsies. Nobody reckons with a gypsy. Although occasionally pessimistic, the narrative of Christina Gill is characterized by persistent agency. It is especially visible when she describes her post-war fate. Not only she decided to come back to Shtorova despite destruction of its Romani social fabric, but most significantly, she moved in 1954 to Nova Huta, the industrial zone of Krakow, where she, together with her future husband, Mountain Nova Auguste Gill, actively participated in building the new socialist city. She tells Sobelman, I came here to Nova Huta because the construction of Huta was beginning and there were many gypsies, lots of them. They built it from scratch. They carried out earthworks. I came here to see how gypsies lived. It was sort of isolated. I was sort of isolated from that life, end of quote. I thought I was in heaven, she said in another interview. Gil tells about her work as a tram driver, her engagement in grassroots Romani organizations, and in the help uh, for socially excluded from many kids and elderly. Her testimony opens, therefore, another, it's another branch. It becomes a narrative of social mobility and female emancipation. Navahuta is, in Gil's account, the Romani brave new world, a reality of open possibilities, a life without exclusion, and the limitations of one, a one ounce community, a space of ethnic, gender, and class equality, so well portrayed in the famous photos of Romani women, victory players, from Victor Penta's archival photograph. It has to be noted, uh, however, that today the Romani origins of Nova Huta are almost forgotten, and the Roma are considered a non-integrated minority of Krakow's post-industrial district. After this interview, Christina Gill would go on to become a professional witness of Romani genocide in Poland. In 1997, she would record her testimony for the Shoah Foundation and for the Documentation and Cultural Center of German City and Roma in Heidelberg. She also started to participate in the Romani Caravan of Memory, a memorial initiative to commemorate sites of Roma Holocaust in the region of southern Poland. And every year in July, she gave her testimony at the Sturova <coughs> Cemetery. Over the years, she became a most prominent witness of the Romani Holocaust in Poland and Europe, and a symbol of Romani struggle for recognition. In her photo interview from 1995, Christina Gill, in a sense, becomes a witness because she does it for the first time publicly, but also because in a given framework, she needs to constantly negotiate her testimony agent, testimonial agency 
on the intersection of her ethnicity, gender, and class. As a Romney explaining her story for two Jewish to a Jewish interviewer, as a woman narrating her own emancipation, as a person from working class telling her face to a Warsaw intellectual. Only reading her video interview as a complex performative situation may give us uh, insight in the dynamics of testimonial society of knowledge production and entanglements of memory and power. It also allows us to rethink our usual expectations towards uh, Holocaust testimony and witness. To conclude, I would like to come back for a second to the monumental installation of Mabuja Tamir Gattas. In her artistic work, Tamir Gattas potentializes uh, Romani history to use Ariela Azulay's phrase. She activates scenarios that have been on the sidelines of mainstream narratives. In this context, Christina Gill's Fortuna interview receives a second life not only as a part of Romani her story, but also as a site of knowledge production, Romani remembrance and memorial agency. Thank you. Thank you. And now our third speaker, Anna Belen Martin Sibiano. Um, Ethics and aesthetics in trauma narratives, testimony, Autobiography and the pitfalls of textual representation. For bringing us and uh, here is a is a wonderful opportunity, and um, um, I have to say, um, probably not a historian. And <laughs> <laughs> we're moving now to the field of literature, so um, I'm very happy actually, and great job organizers, as how things are coming together. We are work, working in different disciplines and still we're talking about the same problems and the theoretical problems. And uh, you can see now that my presentation relates to uh, some of the uh, theoretical points that uh, uh, Verena and uh, Sinina have presented, but also I'm so happy that Milanke and Alexandra have brought the voices here and have made it <coughs> present, right? Because uh, my presentation also a little bit theoretical. Still, I'm like, I, I think I want to bring the, the voices here, but sometimes it's difficult. And um, let's see if I can manage this to change that. Oh. So um, this presentation is part of a bigger project on um, narratives of the South, um, South in Romani literature. And I tackle three uh, literary genres, which are autobiography, testimony, literary testimony, <laughs> I want to emphasize that, because, and, and autofiction. And um, I can see that, uh, in particular, not only the content, the narratives, but also the, the genre, the literary genres, how they form, uh, how the horizon of expectations of the readers, um, I, uh, how that has an impact, the actual um, uh, shape of a given literary genre. And for that, I draw on Leo Vygotsky notions of literature as cultural mediation. And I, I analyze in, in this project issues that have to be with autoethnography, um, new representations, but also how uh, Roma still represent themselves um, um, uh, using um, hegemonic uh, um, concepts, which uh, comes to uh, double consciousness. And um, yeah, I wanted to, 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 to say that. So um, literary genres uh, are ideological practices that embody the social processes and struggles of any given time. This embodiment occurs not only in terms of their content, but also in terms of their form, the devices and the strategies of representation. 
Testimonial narrative has been shaped during the last quarter of the 20th century in the context of social struggles led by persecuted political or ethnic groups. As a narrative of the self, um, testimony shares a common ground with autobiography, which also shifted in the 19th century when it was progressively appropriated by mar marginalized groups, who, by telling their lives, question the principles of domination and authority that canonic autobiography entail. Testimony and autobiography are cru crucial in the formation of what Barbara Harlow, Harlow has called resistance literatures. And not surprisingly, they are a keystone in learning <laughs> literatures. Um, in terms of textual representation and methodology, testimony is not the same as autobiography. This last one is a non-fiction narrative in which the instances of author, narrator, and main character correspond to the same subject. The narrator usually, not always, presents in first person a selection of life experiences organized in a coherent sequence that has a departing point from where the narrative advances progresses into the future. And the future is usually the location of the author during the writing process. This location is, whether explicitly or not, implicit in the narrative. Um, uh, given that the first person narrator is necessarily informed and conditioned by this location. Additionally, autobiography entails a tacit fact of truth between the author and narrator and the reader. And Philippe Lejeune has extensively done research on that um, uh, path, uh, pact of truth. Um, when we go into a, into a, a bookstore, a library, uh, and we look for autobiography, as readers, we understand um, that what is represented there uh, is, 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 is a true story, right? So our horizon of ex expectations about this narrative is accuracy. Implicitly, this fact guarantees that all depicted events took actual place and that the, the narrator experienced them firsthand unless otherwise specified. In testimony, <clears throat> the narrative is related to life experiences and the pact of truth is still a given, but the triad author narrator main character is somehow compromised by the fact that the author narrator is not the actual person composing, writing the narrative. In testimony, there is a collaborator that has a major impact in the articulation and edition of the narrative. <laughs> Her impact is more extensive than any editorial work performed on autobiographies. Um, so on autobiographies, of course, we have an, a, a writer, an author, who tells us about their, uh, their life, but then we have an edition process like any writing in literature. The life narrative in Testimonies is not directly produced by the narrator, but conducted also in response to a number of questions and Alexandra's um, brought all these questions here for these oral histories, right? And this, uh, these questions have been crafted by the collaborator beforehand and follow a particular logic. Therefore, the narrative in testimonies is somehow directed by these questions that more often than not, and I would say the testimonies that we have published, 95%, um, don't include those questions in the final manuscript. The oral narrative is therefore affected by the person who is asking and listening in order to register it later. And also the circumstances in which this change happened. And Verena has um, this that diagram that was uh, wonderful and very informative, right? Um, at the same time, the collaborator inevitably interprets the oral narrative in the context of her own culture and experience. Finally, and then uh, here, the manuscript follows the same process as any other literary product, adjusted to variables in interest, the authors, collaborator, the publishing house, etc. So there is one, and there is one last fundamental difference between, uh, between autobiography and testimony. 
In the, in the first, in autobiography, the author speaks for herself about herself. In the case of Romani autobiographies, and I'm thinking, for example, of um, Gypsy Boy by Mikey Walsh or American Gypsy by Oksana Marfiotti, um, they consider that ethnic identity within the group to which they belong, but they reflect about very specific experiences they encounter as individuals. The very fact of writing an autobiography conveys a position of authority. In fact, in fact, these authors are writers and have a number of publications that are not necessarily <coughs> autobiographical writings. Conversely, in testimonial narrative, focuses on events that were common to the group to which the narrator belongs and on behalf of which she is speaking. Sometimes this collective subject is indicated in the titles of the works. And here I brought you some of the uh, literary testimonies I'm working with. And we, we can see we, um, um, uh, travelers, so uh, allusions to the group, right? Testimonial narratives such as this are hybrid products. Uh, that sit in the intersection of a number of genres, autobiography, biography, short story, diary, memoirs, essay, and novel. Uh, they make use of literary devices and strategies that necessarily imply a fictionalization of the past. An example of this could be the meticulous description of events that took place years or decades before the writing process. They could not possibly be remembered in the detail, detailed depiction that the account offered, but it is accepted as a literary convention. In fact, uh, no reader would expect to find a direct transcription of the oral memory work uh, filled with gaps and uncertainty. Readers expect to read as much as possible about the actual event, reason why they find acceptable that the author reconstructs the past. The process of remembering involves also a degree of fictionalization in the sense that it is a mental activity informed by many factors, values, culture, but also not only the past, but the present po uh, social position and location of the author narrator. <coughs> in testimonial narrative, the selection of past events is guided by the narrative reason which is often political and personal at once. Since this narrative recounts traumatic experiences that are connected to a certain dimension of the narrator's identity. <clears throat> In this case, the, the Romani testimonies is the ethnic one. Right? The narrative reason has an ethical component as, as well, um, since the recollection of traumatic experiences aims at raising awareness and implicitly poses a claim for justice. Therefore, telling the truth must be done in a compelling way so it can have an impact, which is the point of telling the truth in the first place. Uh, a gypsy in Auschwitz by Otto Rosenberg on these roads um, where our steps have been erased by uh, Bisla Hamstetter and Sage Stoiker's series of autobiographical works are all testimonial narratives. The collaborators, um, Ulrich Enzensberger, Sophie Keppels, and Karin Berger, respectively, conducted interviews, transcribed recordings, and edited the materials. The details they provided, however, about the methodology they followed are limited. We don't have that as readers. Um, many questions remain unanswered in the literary product, again. What were the questions that guided the interview? Were all these questions answered by the narrator? What remained an answer? What was left out in the written narrative and why? And I think this is exactly what Simina and Verena were saying. How has the editor arranged the sequence of events? What procedures have the oral materials undergone in order to fit the writing constraints? What are the effects that this editorial process has on their representation of the narrator uh, and of the events she recounts. 
These three testimonial uh, narratives in particular convey uh, the colloquial tone of oral textuality, and they also respect certain devices that be belong to oral solitary. However, there are also uh, problems in the representation of what was told. Rosenberg's account is quite matter of fact, and despite the colloquial tone, the style has been considerably adjusted to fit grammar correctness, which makes the narrator aloof and withdrawn. In his first chapter, the narrator refers um, his Romani origins, some family practices, and the discrimination he suffered as a kid. After that, he recalls how Roma were sent to special camps in Germany, referring in particular to his encounter as a kid with Eva Justine and Robert Ritter, Eva Justine and Robert Ritter, who used him in the racist experiments. Um, but still, when we are reading uh, the account, we are thinking, why is he telling this in such a matter of fact? Why is not more feeling here? Right? That might be one of the questions. The Stonehenge uh, um, narrative um, uh, and health center are different in that uh, uh, from uh, Otto uh, Rosenberg in the sense that they are richer in terms of literary devices. And precisely because of that, uh, they convey the vibrancy and, um, of Romani uh, um, culture, of the Romani um, symbolic universe, the Romani imaginary, right? Um, so we have two different ways in which the collaborators um, uh, compose the narratives. Testimonial narratives allow uh, a white audience to hear the voice of those who have never been able to represent themselves in the public sphere and cultural produ production. Still, the figure of the collaborator becomes that of a mediator who refuses to appropriate and tell a story that is not his or hers, giving full authority um, to the narrator. John Beverly, who has analyzed Latin American testimonies in the last quarter of the 20th century, points out that the alliance between collaborator and narrator, unquote, can function as an ideological figure or ideology <clears throat> for the possibility of union of a radicalized intelligentsia and the poor or working classes. In this sense, the actors that collaborate in the production of a testimony accept the tensions and contradictions it actually entails, because they are not focusing on representation, but on social transformation. <laughs> Testimonies has opened up new possibilities of writing and understanding literature as a social and cultural product. At the same time, <laughs> testimonies in Romani literatures are connected to oral culture, a way of knowing and being in the world that, is, that was until recently preval, prevalent in most Romani communities, but is fast disappearing. Okay. Thank you. In 2013, uh, Annie Chichu chose a testimonial narrative over an autobiography to refer to the poverty and marginalization she suffered when she migrated from her native Romania to France. Et je suis cigare et je le reste has the subtitle the camp de, uh, translate, From the Camps of uh, Refugees uh, to La Sorbonne which summarizes the astounding trajectory of the narrator, which at the time of publication was only 22 years old. Significantly, the front page uh, of the book states as author, Anina with Frédéric Veil. While the collaborator, a French journalist, appears fully identified, the absence of Anina's last name is precisely connected to the meaning of the title. She is a Romney, and that trait about her identity is what she wants to highlight because he's using her story to advocate for her community. During the narrative, uh, Chichu exposes the dramatic situation Romani migrants experience in Europe, implicitly claiming justice. 
Her particular story, that of success, is connected to the mistreatment that her ethnic group encounters wherever they go as a way of proving that, given the opportunity, Roma, Roma can be accomplished citizens. Uh, Chia Chia could have written about her life herself, but chooses to offer a testimony because this journal inherently contains a political dimension. She is not trying to recapitulate her life as a way of making herself understood, which is the point of autobiography. And um, those autobiographies I, I cited before, Mikey Walsh's or uh, Oksana's Marafiotti's one, that's what they do. But uh, Anina Shushu is doing something differently. She's denouncing the injustices Roma encounter. Um, in this book, she's exercising the political dimension of telling the truth in front of a representative of the hegemonic society. Author and collaborator are representing their social groups, and there is a value in the fact that the oppressed actor is telling the truth while the representative of the main uh, social group is listening to it. Now, there are questions that we cannot help but asking at this point. Would it have the same impact if the collaborator was uh, uh, wrong? As a political literary journal, does the testimony necessarily need the interaction between a member of the minority, who is a narrator and author, and a member of the main group in the society, which is a collaborator? I believe so, as both ends of the equation are symbolic. If she is speaking for her ethnic group, the collaborator is asking and listening on behalf of his. Both actors are enacting a dialogue that should be happening in society, and the testimonial narrative is precisely a, a testimony that it can happen. Um, finally, testimony as, an, as a literary genre has allowed unique voices to be read, but it remains a literary and ethical puzzle which is not the case with other um, genres that feed more traditionally the idea of authority and in which the author is arguably in control of the process of representation, which is not the case in testimonial narratives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for three magnificent uh, papers. Um, that all um, I think interacted with one another well and also reflected uh, in expected and unexpected way from the previous panel. Um, just one or two reflections before we open this up to questions and comments, and we have around 20 minutes or so for this. Um, I found it interesting that this, uh, this whole voicing concept of double consciousness actually ran through all of these, and it was I think um, very clear in this idea of um, a mediation of somebody else's experiences, whether this was through Silberman, whether this was through the collaborative authors, or whether this was through, um, uh, I guess, the transmission through generations, um, or efforts to link up to hegemonic discourses, or in the case of, <coughs> of Spain, to link up to the Romani Holocaust, to somehow <coughs> into the Spanish Romani, or Spanish, even using the term Romani here is trying to do that. So the Spanish uh, um, Pitan, Pitano um, identity. Um, so there's this larger set of questions about um, ascribing membership in certain communities, um, uh, certain communities of fate, certain communities of suffering. Um, there's also a juxtaposition of personal testimony and the collaborator or mediator which I think runs through all of these. And I think is also, this goes back to one of the themes that came up in the, the first panel discussion, is really um, who, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also a question about who, who, who owns these testimonies. Um, I mean, so many of these testimonies were collaborative testimonies in this question, even I think it came out, especially in the last one, where Anina is almost anonymized. <coughs> Right? And this was this was like this early discussion about um, anonymizing being one way to pr protect um, the identity or protect the experiences. And here, this is a self-conscious effort to semi-anonymize. Um, we have a lot of, 
I already will ask the first question. Just got, got a sense of hands of how many questions there are going to be. Okay. So, audience. Yeah. Um, I'll just stand up, otherwise, I can't see. Um, yeah, my, my question is for Anna. Um, it, it sort of connects to the discussion we had in the first panel, and, and I think it, um, it, it probably connects to other presentations that are going to come in the future about texts that we have that come to us collaboratively. And I, I thought it was very interesting how you, you spoke about emotion being present or absent in a text. And I, I think another um, adjective you used is rich. To use. Is it rich or is it not rich? And I was wondering what the relationship is between collaborator and emotion. I mean, first of all, the absence of emotion that we notice it is something very peculiar. When, when we teach the Holocaust and I let my students watch testimonies, they are basically all students are deeply disappointed that there's not more emotion. Um, they want to see people break down the expectation that they don't. So that the so not having emotion is already a very interesting <laughs> sensing the absence of emotion is already something very very interesting that speaks to our expectations perhaps more than than to the text and so my I wonder what the collaborator's role is in working with emotion and I have to think of a fourth uh, text um, that was actually created partially with. Uh, collaboration with a historian, Michael Zimmermann, that is Walter Winter's testimony. He gave several testimonies, also on video, but uh, there are two book versions of this as well. And the first is based on interviews he gave to Michael Zimmermann and another person, so a historian and, and another historian who created it. And then there's a second one, and the foreword says he was very unhappy with that one because it was too close to what he actually said. And instead, the second person created uh, a narrative for him that says what he means but doesn't say um, which again speaks to very weird ways about control <laughs> um, giving con creating control allegedly again you can hear only what he says creating control by giving it up <laughs> but also apparently conveying more emotion which is seen as more authentic even if it's further from what the person actually said so I wonder if maybe there's a collaborator contract, not just a truth contract <laughs> that is underlying this. So I wonder if, if we can reflect on that since, since there was, yeah, since there were normative expectations here, <laughs> but what testimony is supposed to be and when, when it's missing something. Can I just, so Michael Stewart, can I just ask, is that second version the English version? No, no, there's a translation okay. as well, which is a okay. traditional okay. point. The, the yeah. translation in English, if you teach it, is from the first version. Uh, from the Michael Zimmermann. That's what it is. Yeah. I will take Simina's question as well, and then I will have a round I think of it's quite related, actually. Because um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the relationship between the expectation of coherence in a literary text and memory as as a thing that happens to humans and is not coherent in, in its definition. And I think kind of silence is in... Um, I guess the subtext builds into that, right? There's a coherence in the product of, of a film or, or a text that is beyond the initial encounter, I guess. And how do you think about that theoretically, if, if at all? But I also had a question for Alexandra, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your presentation, thank you. And I was wondering um, if you could kind of elaborate on this notion of a professional witness and what it means to think about witnesses in a bureaucratized sense of a profession or something that you do in, in a professional set, setting, um, if that's part of your thoughts or not, but really awesome panel. Thank you. Um, right. So the, the issue of emotion, um, well, is there are not that many uh, reviews or, or critical work uh, about Roger Rosenberg, but the, the few that there are, they point out that the matter of that. And, and I guess when we are, as they, again, this, we go into the horizon of expectations of a reader, when they go to a testimony about the um, experience uh, in, a, in the, um, uh, in the uh, German camp, um, we might uh, have some expectations of reading about emotion. And the fact that uh, Rosenberg is, is very in control. But we don't know. That's, and that's the problem with testimony. We don't know what happened. We don't know what is the sequence 
who arranged the sequence, where the question is the narrative following the, 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 the coherence of the, of the questions or has been arranged afterwards. We don't know as readers uh, the, the product that we encounter, which is a cultural but a social product, which is the book that we buy, doesn't give us those um, details. So, um, but uh, as again, there's the horizon of expectations in a given literary work, we expect uh, that whoever wrote or composed that has given it a coherence because we read to find that. And if we were to read the direct transcriptions of our history, we would be like, what's this? What happened here? This is messy. We don't expect that. We don't want that as readers. Like, um, yeah, so um, it's, it's, we don't know. We are uh, Those are products, and we have to take it out. And um, I'm going to refer briefly, right, in, in Latin American um, literature, which is the main source that I'm using in the, uh, to, to pin theoretically testimonial narratives. Um, so in the 20th century, uh, now that we have data mining about um, references, uh, we have uh, two main authors in Latin American literature that have the most uh, quotes in all kinds of um, different references. One of them is Jorge Luis Borges, Borges, I don't know, in different languages, a very important Argentinian author, considered one of the main with Gabriel Garza Marquez writers in the 20th century. And the other one is none of the other Latin American authors that you might know. <coughs> Garcia Marquez, no, it's Rigoberta Menchú, who is a Guatemalan Mayan um, indigenous woman who uh, um, wrote a testimonial narrative. Rigoberta Michu ended up having a Nobel Prize in Peace for her work denouncing the Roma genocide. And why this testimonial narrative that she wrote in collaboration with the Venezuelan anthropologist, um, the, the whole controversy is that what Rigoberta Michu said was truth. To, did everything happen to her? Why she appropriated things that didn't happen to her to, or to another member of her ethnic group. And that has a lot, I can tell you, as much as Borges. Bibliography, that was a huge uh, thing in Latin American tell, history, um, literary history. Is she really telling us what happened to her? No, she's telling us what happened to the Mayans mm -hmm. and why that was a genocide. And for her, the, the, the goal of presenting that <clears throat> testimony was um, social awareness, social transformation. It wasn't about her experiences. Right? So we have to deal with a political also product, not only literary, which is messy. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for this question. I'm thinking about it all the time right now. Uh, so I use the professional, of course, in a sense of like witness who uh, gives their testimony often and becomes uh, kind of uh, like an icon of witnessing and also appears in different uh, uh, like set uh, contexts to give uh, their testimony. And Christina Gil was one of these witnesses who was uh, repeating her story. This story kind of evolved uh, um, during time and she got many more details about her, uh, her experience like uh, five or ten years later. Um, but uh, actually thinking about profession, um, uh, made me think about this uh, um, disentanglements of economy and memory and that professions uh, should like earn for uh, what they're doing and how actually the whole economy thing works within testimony, how uh, witnesses are not paid for giving their testimony and sometimes they ask for, be, uh, for being paid and actually if we can think about like ethical uh, discussion on uh, exactly what are the ramifications of the fact that their stories go to some archive that is open and uh, um, that um, they don't have any control uh, of their stories but also uh, very often they don't have any 
uh, even like a, a memory of the fact that they gave their testimony because like uh, I don't know how about like uh, other archives I work with USHMM and the only thing that, uh, that uh, the witness gets is like a piece of paper and CD and sometimes not even CD just uh, sometimes only link to their testimony and you can think about how uh, how, how the economy of different different types of economy work uh, here. So uh, yes, professional in a sense of like uh, exemplary, as Noah Schenker called it, or chief uh, witness. But also, I think it's very interesting topic of thinking about professionals uh, in in the whole economical context. So thank you. Do you have any response to it? Do you have a question? Because there were just some reflections. No, I was thinking like um, somehow it's what we are talking. And maybe I'm talking here as a mix of historian and artists is about the representation of memory. Um, so we have, somehow we have to question itself the, 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 the very idea of representation, like who is controlling representation, what what is representation, what is being in the public, you know? and then how is that linked to Romani memory or Roman experiences or Romani sense of aesthetic. Um, that's why it's kind of complicated to, to have the control of the narrative of and the control of representation. So I was thinking that for the future we shouldn't talk on not only about self-representation, but other kinds of being in the public, other self-representations. Like, like mm, 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 earlier in the, the earlier panel and um, they, they, were, they were talking about like the, the things that are not in the document, you know, the the um, smell, the the body, the, all the senses that are not um, like in in the written format, you no? Know? Because somehow the the very young idea of writing something is a is a betrayal to what is being said or felt or eaten or or listened. You know? So, so that, that is what we are talking like, like in, in my case, what I try to do is, is I was like talking about how cinema, even cinema talking about Gitanos has been used to erase the capacity of Roma people to write their own history or to know about other Roma. And that's, and that's, that, um, that process has been, has been uh, controlled through the manipulation of emotions, <laughs> like in cinema, like in music. So this, this song that I put, it's like it's an example. It tells a story of happy gypsies at the same time that the guitars were being murdered. We have time for a few more questions for the. So there's two questions here. And any other questions? Okay, so two short questions. Okay, I just have a quick uh, one small observation that what you just said uh, about the archives and its kind of incompleteness, I think that this is something we kind of uh, have to strive to have a better perspective on, um, you know, using some of the techniques of sort of holistic research that are being mentioned here on these panels. Um, because I think archives will always be incomplete. You know, what you said, the kind of visceral, the taste, the, the, the touch, the texture of the testimony will never be, we could not replicate that, obviously, in my opinion. But given the kind of reflection that we have on these panels, what, what can we bring to make up for that? Or, or in terms of interpretation of the historian, of the researcher, how can we compensate for that? That's, that's something that, that's an ongoing process. But anyway, um, no, my question is actually about the US, uh, US HMM. So in 1995, I had done some preliminary research on Roma Holocaust there. Um, and at that time, the collection, the, the search engine, this is a very practical question for Alexandra and some of the other researchers here, that are the, have, I'm assuming the search engines have improved because uh, I, you know, worry about that a little bit, like, you know, how the, internal librarian or, or cataloger is putting together the, the, the keywords or the search words. So this is, and then the second question is, have you as a research community, not you, but people here gathered, have you gone back and sort of given some feedback to the US HMM in particular 
uh, but also Fortunoff and also the other, you know, have, have you as researchers said, hey, these are some lacuna in how the, uh, you know, collection is, is, has been put together or how we can do the search. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And then uh, one more question. Uh, yes, um, uh, yes, my name is Umo Haiz. I'm a fellow researcher in Women University. I'm also an anthropologist and an artist. Um, yes, I just would like to do some comments and um, yes, try to address the questions concerning regarding uh, collaboration to interviews or collaboration. Yeah, because I, um, I there was some concepts being um, used here, like intersectionality, stereotypes, also regarding Alexander talk about this when talking about the interview. Um, and I saw several sorts in the interview, for example, there is this, um, because we are also talking about representation and um, who is, who holds the legitimation to represent the group, the, the cultural group that's be described in this case, uh, Roma communities. Um, and in this sense, like when we see the, the shirt of the interview, like there is, of course, um, reproduction of stereotypes, lack of like, uh, clashes of ex uh, um, expectations and everything. But in a sense, there is a lot of violence from the interviewer to the interviewer. Um, and somehow this is, uh, how can, can we expect um, representation coming from academia when um, there is no actually, um, um concerning regarding about uh, the ne uh, negation of authority perspectives in regarding to government somehow um and in this sense yes so, so like try to think in not in representative minority group but actually um how to and, and then we can try to learn from because i hear here for example uh, mm, reference to Black Lives Matter, but what we can learn from street movements, activist movements. Um, and so what a collaboration can give for the communities and actually um, how can um, collaboration, collaborations work to uh, give something back? Thank you. So, uh, these are just the, the whole panel, so we'll just have a lot of stuff who wants to answer this. Are we expecting that from the um, academia? Are we expecting academia represent? I mean, I mean, how can um, institutions who had hold um, um, power over narratives of a group can be able to represent and actually not be the position to hold the space for different representations? Because then we have to think about um, heterogeneity. And also, for example, because I hear like this, uh, um, that uh, contradictions is a West privilege, and actually is not. Actually, the norm is the West, Western, Western knowledge or Western production of knowledge, uh, and the contradictions come when marginalized groups start to take voice and evidence the contradictions. Actually, the contradictions were there already, but just not be. Um, 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 field in dispute. So we, even when minority. Members of a group, members of a minority come into institutions. They, so you, you, you have to accept, or you are assimilated, and then you use the frameworks of the institution, or you start destroying the system from the side. Alexandra or Anna, do you, does one of you want to have a final word? <laughs> Yeah, I can just say that about the violence of representation, I think the way is to somehow uh, like take what's there and try to not uh, narrate the representation, but rather analyze it as like this kind of performative field and raise the tensions. And I think this might a bit uh, ease, the, uh, ease the fact that we are still working with representation. So I'm more interested in this like performances of testimonies um, but of course, like the question of representation and my own positionality as an analyze person who analyzes this is very tricky. Yeah, like um, at the same time that I said all of this, or it's wonderful to have, uh, say, just like a, a testimony or the other ones, Rosenberg's. Uh, we can we we are just question how um, those testimonies um, are a product 
have been constructed. But at the same time, what we have is wonderful to have that. And those in particular, like the new generation Roma born in, at the, in the last quarter of the 20th century, like the ones I refer to, have the tools to intervene in literature, which as itself is a Western con uh, concept. And, and um, But those uh, previous generations of Roma didn't have those tools. Um, so their intervention through their collaborator or, um, is still an intervention that is very worth it. But, um, um, Thank you uh, to all three of you and everybody who has questions. Um, we're going to continue this now over lunch. Um, right, this is the next, uh, yes, we are going to continue this over lunch, which I believe is, is right out here where the reception was. Uh, no, I just have some information about lunch. <laughs> Follow me, first of all, because the lunch is not going to be here, but in the Estranto Coffee. And... So we ordered lunch for the official participants, but we would like to invite also the audiences here because um, we are like around 40 and we can afford it. So let's go. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we can just only buy it. Completely eliminating me out of the I mean, try to learn the classic. They sent me as a reader to review should we be publishing this. That's because I was so upset. And he wanted me to read the English guy, but we were forward. So, it was through Mithar that we got to Vincent.